Hi, everyone. I'm Bunny Ellerin, co-founder and president of New York City Health Business Leaders, and we're thrilled to welcome you to Healthcare Rocks. This is a very different type of event for us. Normally, we'd be holding a panel on a topic like telehealth reimbursement or value-based care, but not tonight. Tonight, we're going to kick back, listen to music, and have some fun. We've spent months organizing this show to honor New York and all it stands for, resilience, toughness, compassion, and caring. You'll hear from a few physicians nominated by their peers for their extraordinary work during COVID-19. You'll also meet healthcare leaders who stepped up during our time of need. To give you insight into what else is in store is my co-host and colleague, Gail Addo, CEO and co-founder of Rubicon MD, a New York City digital health company focused on empowering primary care. Thanks, Bunny. This has been a year like no other, and we wanted to wrap it up with some happiness. There's no better way to do that with them through music. We've got an incredible mix of doctors and med students who moonlight as musicians alongside industry artists passionate about social justice and a group of talented musicians from New York City's legendary LaGuardia High School. Best of all, we're doing this to benefit three charities. We're raising money for the Food Bank for New York City, the Child Center of New York, and Vibrant Emotional Health. And there will be many opportunities to contribute to these wonderful charities throughout the evening. But for now, let's get ready to party. Everyone, please use the chat box in the right side of your screen and let us know what you think throughout the show. Start now by telling us where you're watching from. And now to our first act. My name is Dr. Geraldine McGinty, and I'm a proud board member of New York City Healthcare Business Leaders. I'm also Chief Contracting and Strategy Officer at Royal Cornell Medicine. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Colin Brathwaite and Dr. Sude Ranjbar, two surgeons from NYU Langone on Long Island, who have not only been on the front lines as essential workers during COVID-19, but have been inspiring their patients and the community with the healing power of their music.
I'm here with Sloan Gayon, CEO of PulsePoint, and PulsePoint's been a really long time supporter of NYCHPL. So that performance was incredible. Um, and even more so, you know, Dr. Brathwaite by day is chairman of surgery at NYU Langone on Long Island, and Dr. Ranjbar is a surgical resident. Yeah, Bunny, that was awesome. Uh, and I think that was an Alicia Key song, right? Yep. Uh, I yep. think you wrote it a number of years ago to pay tribute to everyday heroes like these doctors. Yeah, no, exactly. And it really made me think about why we organized this concert in the first place. Um, Sloan, did you know that you were the inspiration? No, really? Well, well, first off, thanks for inviting me to participate, Bunny. Um, we're really happy to support this effort. And second, no, I, I had no idea how. <laughs> All right, well, in the spring when everything started happening uh, with COVID, you launched this initiative to recognize frontline workers and um, especially our doctors with a ticker tape parade. Um, and I signed on to that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that initiative? Sure, absolutely. Well, Bunny, as a lifelong New Yorker, I've attended so many of these ticker tape parades in my lifetime uh, for the Yankees, for the space shuttle, for the World Cup team and many, many others. And I've always felt they've represented the true essence of New Yorkers, sort of passionate people who love to celebrate success. And so it's not lost on me and never has been that parades are held in a place down Broadway called the Canyon of Heroes. And so I wanted to showcase all the frontline workers and everything they, they did for us. Uh, they're the true heroes to our society. And so when I was thinking about this parade and I was talking to my wife about it, I, I logged on to change.org. I started a petition and about a month later, sure enough, we hit our goal. And then soon thereafter, Mayor de Blasio announced there'd be a parade for healthcare workers down the Canyon of Heroes. So although I thought for sure we'd have this parade by now, we'll be involved whenever it happens and hopefully that will be soon. Well, I loved it when you first thought of it, and I think it's such a great initiative. Um, and again, thank you for being an inspiration, and thank you for supporting the concert. So enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks so much, Bunny, and I'm looking forward to the next act. My name is Sherman Learn, and I'm an early stage healthcare investor at Alley Corp here in New York City, and also a medical student at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. When a pandemic hit back in March, Mount Sinai was one of the first hospitals to jump into action, and many of us medical students joined in to help however we could. In fact, students at Mount Sinai organized one of the largest medical school responses in the country in close partnership with our hospital system, helping with everything from coordinating PPE donations, to triaging telehealth visits, to staffing pharmacy sites, and boosting our COVID-19 testing capabilities. Today, I'm honored and excited to be introducing two of my medical school classmates who have been part of these incredible efforts, Adam Lieber and Varsha Supermanium. They've been supporting the front lines, not only as fourth year medical students, but also as talented physicians. Adam is a native New Yorker who has been playing guitar and piano since he was six and will be going into emergency medicine. Varsha's from New Jersey and has been singing since she was three and she'll be going into internal medicine. Please join me in warmly welcoming Adam and Varsha. Hi, how are you? My name is Adam. And I'm Varsha. And we are fourth year medical students at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. This is Rainbow by Casey Musgraves. We hope you enjoy. Sky 
Thank you so much. Well, I am thrilled um, to welcome here today, Dr. Rob Fields, um, to be able to share a little bit about um, the incredible work that he's been doing um, and the things that he's been writing about through the pandemic um, as he's taken a lead in New York. Um, so uh, Dr. Fields, welcome. And maybe you can start by sharing a little bit about um, your background. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Gil and, and Bunny. I, I, I can't thank you enough for helping spread the message of what we need to get done in this industry to establish equity um, in our communities. But um, yeah, so I'm a family physician. Uh, I'm currently the senior vice president and chief medical officer for population health. So, you know, sort of fancy title, but I always start with them a family doc first. When, when we started this work back in late March, early April, as the pandemic hit, um, it be, uh, what was starting to happen is that our care management teams were receiving inbounds, right? They're, they're already used to doing outreach for high risk individuals. They were getting inbounds from all sorts of folks saying, um, you know, I'm having behavioral health issues, increased suicidality, anxiety, food insecurity issues, et cetera, et cetera, long list of things. And some of the services that we could offer to address those required broadband, Wi-Fi access, et cetera. And it became really clear that a lot of most, our most vulnerable folks didn't have it. Education had an imperative to solve it today right? because they had a bunch of kids at home. All right, well now let's use that as a potential solution. So if the schools were able to distribute cellular enabled laptops or tablets, that now provides access in the home that can be used for other things besides education. Can we piggyback on that infrastructure and start to chip away at, all right, with these, this particular population, how can we engage them in, in such a way that they can now use that tablet to get a telehealth visit. Tell us what you're doing with the Dream School, what Mount Sinai is doing in the community. We were partnered with the Dream School, it was a public charter school in East Harlem. They serve about 1,200 kids, K through 12, um, who predominantly come from uh, NYCHA buildings that are very close. And so almost by definition, by when they get in the school, these are vulnerable populations by definition. Um, and the advantage there is that the Dream School you know, they're, they're not just teachers and social workers, they have a relation, they take a whole family approach, they engage the entire family, they, they were already trying to solve food issues for their families, things like that. And what they have, which we don't have as a health system is a relationship with that community that's well integrated, and the families are engaged, they respond to the dream school, they answer their calls. Um, and so what we have been trying to work on with them or have been working on is um, everything from can we provide asthma education in the midst of a pandemic? And so we use the laptop they have in the home to provide widespread, not only education, but interaction. Like the parents could ask questions and put in the chat with physicians. Like when does that happen for someone who lives, you know, probably anywhere, uh, yeah. but certainly in, in public housing. How do you and Gail work together on the, on the telehealth equity? So early pandemic, um, it just became very apparent um, that um, all of the issues that we saw around COVID-19 and how it was disproportionately impacting marginalized communities and vulnerable populations um, was not a separate issue from what we saw around the murder of George Floyd and systemic racism, but they were intimately related and the same challenges were affecting healthcare delivery. Um, and as the world moved to virtual, we had a few early conversations um, with people that highlighted um, how this was exacerbating existing inequities um, for all of the challenges um, that Rob had alluded to. There's the digital divide, the safety net providers don't have the same technology um, and services infrastructure. Um, and there's really not um, a focus on being able to allow those populations to access health services virtually. So um, it's really about finding folks who are doing um, this incredible work and amplifying them, amplifying it and bringing resources with a really bold goal um, to improve access to care for 100,000 uh, people in communities of color in New York um, and a million people across the country. People can go to the Health Tech for Medicaid website, ht4m.org, um, and uh, um, look at our telehealth equity campaign and get involved. Hi, I'm Julian Dubois. I'm a board member of New York Health Business Leaders, and it's a great honor to be part of tonight's charity concert. 
Thank you very much, Bernie, for the invitation. COVID has impacted us and our lives in a way that none of us could have imagined. Many of our peers, uh, not only physicians, but also nurses and charities, have been among the very first people in the country to respond to the epidemic, especially in New York City. They are truly the frontline heroes of 2020. So as a thank you to them and as a tribute to their courage and resilience, it is my great pleasure to introduce Landon Westbrook and Anand Gaon, two longtime New Yorkers who are partners in business, but also in the real life, along with their kids, Harrison on drums, Lilu on ukulele, and Carter on keys. Together, they are the Gaon family rocks. Please give them a round of applause and join me in welcoming them. Have a great show. Hi, I'm Harrison. Hi, I'm Landon. Hi, I'm Leela. I'm Anand. And I'm Carter. We are Gone Family Rocks and we want to say huge thank you to all the heroes of 2020. It's been quite a year, but we are going to end it with joy and love. Tonight is also about raising money for vulnerable New Yorkers. We've selected three charities that address some of the city's greatest challenges. 
Food insecurity in New York is rampant with the rise of hunger growing daily. Thankfully, Food Bank for New York City exists and has been working to end food poverty in the five boroughs for over 36 years. Since March, Food Bank has distributed over 56 million meals citywide and continues to stand at the front lines for New Yorkers in need. Through their community kitchen and food pantry in Harlem, mobile pop-ups and network of partners, Food Bank for New York City is continuing to help those hardest hit by the pandemic. Children in our city have been especially hard hit this past year, struggling emotionally and physically. The Child Center of New York, which offers behavioral health, integrated care, family support, and youth development services, has been there every step of the way to help them. In August, Child Center received the 2020 Community Cares Award from the New York State Office of Mental Health. Their extraordinary work helps children and families with the skills and emotional support necessary to build healthy, successful lives. It's no secret that we're confronting another epidemic. We're in a mental health crisis in this country. Vibrant emotional health is unwavering in its belief that everyone can achieve emotional wellness with the right care and support. A great example is their New York City Frontline Essential Workers Hotline. Doctors, nurses, EMTs, and hospital workers can connect with counselors by phone confidentially and for free. Vibrant also administers the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Thank you to all these incredible organizations for the work they do every day to help our fellow New Yorkers. Hi, AJ. How you doing? Good. How are you doing, Bunny? I'm good. Well, welcome to Healthcare Rocks. Um, you know, you were one of the first people who said yes um, when I proposed the idea of this concert. So thank you very much for that. Um, and it's been a really, it's been a tough year for a lot of people. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that stood out to me about you, uh, you were in our digital health report. And in there, you talked a little bit about the scholarship that you launched. Um, can you talk about that scholarship and, and what it is and why you did it? Yeah, you know, thank you so much you know it, it's something that means a lot not just to myself but the scholarship to my entire organization and you know it was a difficult year you know we had challenges of a pandemic that is still with us coupled with social challenges and change that we're looking for in our culture and society and i challenge not just myself but our staff to look inwards and think about there are so many different ways we can and we're thankfully in a position to help our communities and we wanted to think about something that was connected to our organization. We're a pharmacy benefit manager, so we're in healthcare. And we wanted to look also at New York City. You know, obviously, it's such an incredible tradition of healthcare and innovation. And when we started to do some research, a name started to surface Dr. James McCune Smith. AJ, who is Dr. James McCune Smith? Dr. James McCune Smith is the first African American physician in the US. And his life, his goals, his achievements is what inspired us to reach out to Howard University's College of Pharmacy. And what we wanted to do was to create a scholarship and endow in his honor. And when we looked at the College of Pharmacy, the real important connection point was in addition to being the first physician, he also created the first African-American owned pharmacy in the United States. Well, AJ, thank you for jumping on board and for being part of Healthcare Rocks. No, thank you so much for having me, Bunny. I've truly enjoyed our interview and obviously love the music and the day. Rock on. Steph Reed is a singer, songwriter, producer, multi-instrumentalist, and Grammy-nominated music educator. Last year, GFR had the pleasure of performing at a music festival with Steph, and it was a powerful experience. My lasting memory of that performance was Steph ending his set by coming into the crowd and inviting the audience to hold hands and sing together 
for quality, peace, and freedom. It is my great pleasure to present Steph Reed. So I'm with Mike Cunyon, the CEO of Remedy Health Media. Mike's been a longtime supporter of New York City Health Business Leaders. You know, Mike, I've known you a long time. And one thing that really stands out about you is your empathy and how much you care about people, um, especially the people who work for you. How have you been able to keep your own um, workforce connected and motivated during the past year? Uh, being the CEO of a company, while everyone was navigating so much change, you know, things became really clear and, and really quite simple. Um, it was so important for us to prioritize health and safety and not just physical health, but mental health. And, and the first thing that we thought about as a team was how can we stay connected? And so we kicked off a, a, a ton of events, if you will, uh, morning meditation sessions, uh, lunchtime workouts, uh, daily planking exercises. Uh, employees volunteered to teach yoga classes during the day. Uh, we had subgroups in Slack that were doing squats and making sure that everybody was drinking enough water. 
uh, trivia <laughs> night. I mean, we had all kinds of crazy stuff and, and it was awesome. And, you know, in a weird way, um, you know, the pandemic created a bit of a silver lining because everybody was home. Everybody was navigating this difficult moment together. Everybody had their kids in the background and dogs barking and leaf blowers and all the nonsense. And, you know, uh, people showed up bringing their whole self to work, not just their work self to work. And I think that's how it should be. Um, so in a, in, a, in a difficult time, there've been a lot of silver linings and um, the team's been awesome. It's been, um, it's been quite a season. And, and there's been a lot of good that's come out of it. You can't talk about 2020 without talking about mental health. And this year, the conversations have not been easy. One in five COVID-19 patients will be diagnosed with a mental illness within three months of testing positive for coronavirus. Three months. And those with pre-existing mental illness are 65% more likely to be diagnosed with corona. This all comes on the heels of a national shortage of psychiatrists. Now more than ever, mental health care is absolutely essential. And as a leader in the field for 25 years, SciComm is committed to covering the pandemic like no other. Whether that's giving readers free self-assessments, helping them navigate their new abnormal, or exposing deep racial disparities in our healthcare system. We will continue to have these conversations, no matter how difficult, so that every American feels seen, heard, and gets the treatment they so deserve. COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on all of our lives, but for the 60% of people with chronic illness, the pandemic has been particularly fraught. When Remedy Health Media did a survey of 4,000 adults, we learned that 35% of them wished that they had more information on, on how the virus impacts chronic life. So to that end, Health Central and all of the brands at Remedy made it our mission to make sure we created content specifically to meet the needs of the chronic community. At Health Central, we created a series of condition-specific articles, everything from heart disease to autoimmune disorders to IBD and how COVID impacted people with these illnesses. And we also paired them each with a Facebook Live where our audience could ask questions to one of the doctors from our medical board. For us, the challenge on the body for people living with HIV and on the body pro for healthcare providers was to meet these many intersecting moments and needs with reliable information, with affirmation, with support, with realism, and with a sense of empathy that helps the communities we serve take the best care of themselves that they can and live to see a better day. We are going to continue to celebrate, to honor, and to appreciate all the work that our frontline workers do. And for that, we say thank you. Peter Frischauf here, founding director, New York City Health Business Leaders. Confession. Before high school, I was a terrible student. Then, in 1963, I auditioned my way into the High School of Music and Art, playing the violin. Perfect for misfits like me, celebrated in the movie and television show, Fame, created by Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia who called the school, quote, the most hopeful accomplishment of his term. Wow! And now, Robert Apostle and the New Music Ensemble. Since 1998, this apostle, with the blessing and support of music chair Bernice Green Fleischer, broke out of the normal music curriculum and created a unique space for songwriting. If you're a fan of the Radio Lab show or podcast, seen Beasts of the Southern Wild, or heard Pia Toscano sing I'll Stand By You on American Idol, you've already tasted the inspiration of Robert Apostle. And now, on Healthcare Rocks, you're getting a full meal. Enjoy! I've 
lurking someone's behind the door i've been wandering on a two by four glass keeps cracking it wasn't there before i've been wandering on a two by four shadows lurking someone's behind the door crimson autumn filled with angst in the air she keeps turning to look for something that isn't there. Ooh, ah, da, da, da. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. She's looking for something that isn't there. Ooh, ah, oh, oh, oh. Ooh. Hey everyone, um, Gail and I are here with three clinicians. All of them were on the front lines of COVID when it first started and are still there. Um, and we are gonna hear their stories. So uh, I'm Dr. Gold. I'm a third year cardiology fellow at Mount Sinai uh, where I also rotate at Elmhurst Hospital um, and basically was deployed pretty immediately in March uh, to help Elmhurst, uh, you know, battle COVID. I am Dr. Arabia Molet. I am an emergency medicine physician for God knows how many years. I was initially trained back home in Cuba. Uh, so this is not my first rodeo with the, working in a pandemic. I work in Brooklyn at Brookdale University Hospital, which serves several communities as East New York, Brownsville, Flatbush, Canarsie, and Starrett City. And as a matter of fact, the numbers had came out that we were actually hit the hardest in the entire state of New York and had the highest rate of deaths and was largely ignored for, for several weeks. I am Ray Lorenzoni, a pediatrician trained at Montefiore and currently training in pediatric cardiology at Monte. Um, the Children's Hospital up there serves um, all of the pediatric, cardio or pediatric cardiology needs for most of the hospitals in the Bronx. And the Bronx, as many of us know, was particularly hard hit by coronavirus as well. So each of you uh, was on the front lines and, um, you know, now many months later, what, what stands out about that time? I uh, primarily worked on the front lines during March and April when it was the worst. In New York City, the one of the floors of the Children's Hospital was converted to an adult uh, unit to take care of coronavirus patients. The unit basically as soon as it opened up was filled with adult patients and many of us hadn't taken care of adult patients in uh, close to a decade. And this was, uh, you know, we had to relearn adult medicine, we had to learn, relearn uh, respiratory management for these patients and we did. I think the the most touching aspect of that time was a lot of the humanity that came into it. A lot of the times it was a single physician going in and out of rooms to try and minimize exposure. And so that physician knew most of the patients. And, uh, you know, when I was that physician, it was tough. You know, you sat down with patients, you explained the situation. You obviously tried to comfort a lot of their fears, but you, both you and the patient knew that everything that could be done was being done and that there just weren't a lot of answers. 
you know, the thing to know about Elmhurst is that it is a city hospital uh, that is basically operating on a shoestring budget with, um, you know, basically, uh, it, it's basically at maximum capacity always and always kind of gets by uh, by the skin of its teeth. Um, so to all of a sudden have, you know, hun literally hundreds of COVID patients per day flooding into the ER and then making their ways to the floors, um, you know, the system was completely overwhelmed and it transformed the hospital into a place that was you know, basically unrecognizable to me. But the thing that kind of anchored me was um, the fact that basically everybody in the hospital pulled together with a heroic effort. Um, you know, from, from the attendings, you know, in their 60s and 70s coming in to, to med students, to nurses just absolutely selflessly gearing up and feeding patients and doing the vent setting changes and, um, you know, right, right down to the, you know, cafeteria workers and janitors, uh, you know, who didn't miss a beat. I will say that what stood out the most was the pandemic of racism that came out of this pandemic where disproportionately black and brown people had died from this pandemic and not because, just because of the virus itself, more so because of, uh, I would say systematic racism, institutionalized racism. I work in a very poor resource community, um, a level one trauma center in Brooklyn. And I, I say this because there is institutional disparities. Depending on where one lives, that hospital may have the resources. And there were reports that there were certain hospitals that were in more affluent neighborhoods throughout New York City were able to receive financial backing. Whereas hospitals um, such as the hospital where I work, uh, where I work at did not necessarily receive a lot of support initially. I think the New Yorkers, we did the best we could. We pulled through. Unfortunately, many people had died from the nursing homes as well. But, you know, we it, we were in a medical war zone. Like I have mentioned on CNN and Dr. Oz and many other outlets that we were in a medical war zone. We still are. But I will say that, you know, New York definitely pulled through. And it wasn't just the doctors and the nurses and other allied healthcare professionals. It was the community. First, a, a huge, huge thank you to you three for um, your service and what you guys did through um, a pandemic. Um, and really, um, you guys were the heroes through um, what we saw in New York.
inspiration for everything. It's the reason the cage bird sings. It shines like drives out the time in history where it feels like the vision is at its highest. The powers that be are spreading messages of hate. We have to understand that we come together as one race, the human race, that we can't let the enemy divide us, that we are all we got. We are as strong as our neighbor, as strong as our brothers and as strong as our sisters. This is holy ground. This is a holy war. Blessed are those. Blessed are those who believe in love. Blessed are those who believe in humanity. Do you believe in the power of love? I believe in the power. Wow, Steph Reed, you rock. That was amazing. Thank you. What a night. We hope all this amazing talent brought a smile to your face. And please, please, please consider donating to our charities. You'll see the link in the chat. And to all the clinicians and frontline workers who continue to work tirelessly for us, thank you. New York City couldn't have come this far without you. Before we go to the last song of the evening with Adam and Varsha, we'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Without their support, tonight would not have been possible. So a big thank you to Able To, Alley Corp, BDO, Brayburn Pharmaceuticals, Capital Rx, Cheryl Hazan Galleries, Clarify, Genoa Telepsychiatry, IQVIA, Q, Oxion, Medscape, PulsePoint, Remedy Health Media, and Rubicon MD. And a very special thanks to two very special contributors, 
Jeremy Miller, and Therese Cunningham. Going into tonight, we had raised just about $32,000 for these three charities. Our goal would be $45,000 so that we could contribute $15,000 each from Healthcare Rocks. So we hope that we're, with your giving during the evening and afterwards, we will be able to meet that goal. And now, on to Adam and Varsha. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 